We are now on page 12 of 72. We are 19% into the book. In a few minutes more, there came over the scene another radical alteration. The general surface grew somewhat more smooth, and the whirlpools one by one disappeared. Did you hear that? That was dusty. While prodigious streaks of foam became apparent where none had been seen before. Oh, so the foam was crucial to the story. Cool! Yeah, okay, this will be my voice. You know my voice. This is the narrator. This is the old man. Okay, good. Right. These streaks at length spreading out to a great distance and entering into combination took unto themselves the gyratory motion of the subsided vortices. <laughs> This is funny because I don't understand half of the words. And seem to form the germ of another more vast. Suddenly, very su suddenly, very suddenly, this assumed a distinct and definite existence. In a circle of more than a mile in diameter, the edge of the whirl was represented by a broad belt of gleaming spray. But no particle of this slipped into the mouth of the terrific funnel, whose interior, as far as the eye could fathom it, was a smooth, shining and jet-black wall of water, inclined to the horizon at an angle of some forty-five degrees. Speeding dizzily round and round with a swaying and sweltering motion, and sending forth to the winds an appalling voice, half shriek, half roar, such as not even the mighty cataract of Niagara ever lifts up in its agony to heaven. The mountain trembled to its very base, and the rock rocked. What? I threw myself upon my face, ow, and clung to the scant herbage <laughs> in an excess of nervous agitation. This! I said at length to the old man, This can be nothing else than the great whirlpool of the maelstrom. So it is sometimes termed, he, sa he said. We Norwegians call it the Moscowstrom, from the island of Moscow in the midway. The ordinary accounts of this vortex had by no means prepared me for what I saw. That of Jonas Ramus, which is perhaps the most circumstantial of any cannot impart the faintest conception either of the magnificence or of the horror of the scene or of the wild bewildering sense of the novel which confounds the beholder i am not sure from what point of view the writer in question surveyed it nor at what time but it could neither have been from the summit of helsingen nor during the storm there are some passages of his description, nevertheless, which may be quoted for their details, although their effect is exceedingly feeble in conveying an impression of the spectacle. Um. Between Lofoden and Moscow, he says, the depth of the water is between thirty-six and forty fathoms, but on the other side towards Ver Verg, this depth decreases so as not to afford a convenient passage for a vessel without the risk of splitting on the rocks, which happens even in the calmest weather. When it is flood, the stream runs up the country between Lofoden and Moscow with a boisterous rapidity, but the roar of its impetuous ebb to the sea is scarce equalled by the loudest and most dreadful cataracts, uh, the noise being heard several leagues off, and the vortices or pits are of such an extent and depth that if a ship comes within its attraction, it is inevitably absorbed and carried down to the bottom, and there beat to pieces against the rocks. And when the water relaxes, the fragments thereof are thrown up again. Just like dinner last night. But these intervals of tranquility are only at the turn of the ebb and flood. And in calm weather, and last but a quarter of an hour, its violence gradually returning. 
When the stream is most boisterous and its fury heightened by a storm, it is dangerous to come within a Norway mile of it. What? All miles are the same. Ah, boats, yachts, and ships have been carried away by not guarding against it before they were within its reach. It likewise happens frequently that whales come too near the, the stream and are overpowered by its violence. He doesn't shout, does he? And then it is impossible to describe their howlings and bellowings in their fruitless struggles to disengage themselves. A bear once, attempting to swim from Lofoden to Moscow, was caught by the stream and borne down while he roared terribly, so as to be heard on shore. Large stocks of firs and pine trees, after being absorbed by the current, rise again broken and torn to such a degree as if bristles grew upon them. This plainly shows the bottom to consist of craggy rocks, among which they are whirled to and fro. Oi! The stream is regulated by the flux and reflux of the sea. It, be, it being constantly high and low water every six hours. In the year 1645, early in the morning of sex, oh, sex, I mean, sexagesima Sunday, it raised, which, it raged, uh, it raged with such noise and impetuosity that the very stones of the houses on the coast fell to the ground. In regard to the depth of the water, I cannot see how this could have been ascertained at all in the immediate vicinity of the vortex. The forty fathoms must have referenced only to portions of the channel close upon the shore, either of Moscow or Lofoden. The depth in the centre of the Moscow strom must be immeasurably greater, and no better proof of this fact is necessary than can be obtained from even the sidelong glance into the abyss of the whirl, which may be had from the highest crag of Helsingen, looking down from this pinnacle upon the howling phlegathon. <laughs> Below, I cannot help. I cannot help smiling at the simplicity of which the honest Jonas Ramus records, as a matter difficult to believe, of belief, the anecdotes of the whales and the bears. For it appeared to me, in fact, the self-evident thing, that the largest ship of the line in existence, coming within the influence of the dead, that deadly attraction, could resist it as little as a feather. The hurricane, and must disappear bodily and at once. I don't get it. I really don't. This has lost me. The attempts to account for the phenomenon, some of which I remember, seemed to me sufficiently plausible in per perusal, now wore a very different and unsatisfactory aspect. The idea generally received is that this, as well as three smaller vortices among the Faroe Islands, have no other cause than the collision of waves rising and falling at flux and reflux against the ridge of rocks and shelves which confines the water so that it precipitates itself like a cataract and thus the higher the flood rises the deeper must the fall be and the natural result of all is a whirlpool or vortex the prodigious suction oh, of which is sufficiently known by lesser experiments. These are the words of the Starship Enterprise. I mean, these are the words of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. Kircher and the others imagine that in the centre of the channel of the Maelstrom is an abyss penetrating oh, the globe and issuing in some very remote part the Gulf of Bothnia, being somewhat decidedly named in one instance. Ah. Um, this opinion, idle in itself, was the one to which, as I gazed, my imagination most readily assented, and mentioning it to the guide, I was rather surprised to hear him say that, although it was the, the view almost universally entertained of the subject by the Norwegians. It nevertheless was not his own. As to the former notion, he confessed his inability to comprehend it, and here I agreed with him, for, however conclusive on paper, it becomes altogether unintelligible and even absurd amid the thunder of the abyss. 
Hmm, next part, please. Oh, this is beautiful. What? Apparently this is a horror. I don't get it myself. 